<laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Everyone good Passover? Lots of yummy matzah? No, it's disgusting. Anyone ever had matzah? If you haven't had it, you can stop on my office. I'll give you a piece, okay? It's not good. It's disgusting, but I'll give you a piece. So enjoy it. It represents suffering. And it is suffering. It's a bread of affliction. <laughs> I should, I should actually hand that to an exam to enhance the suffering, but I'll, I'll, I will, I will abstain. Do you have like real, like Israeli matzah, or do you have like? I, I, I either one you buy in a box at, at, at Kroger. <laughs> but I, I did eat the real stuff. I mean, the, the, the actual prohibition is it can't. So, so what's matzah? It's unleavened bread, right? So it's basically flour and water. But there's a time limit where the water and flour can only touch was like 20 seconds or some time period. It's like 17 seconds. They time it, so it's a very short period, and it's just really flat, crackery thing. I mean, for those of you who are Catholic, the Holy Communion, the wafer, that's the fact that's supposed to be the matzah, the, not, not the body of anyone in our faith, but, you know, that, that's, that's the, the origin of it. Jared? Oh, no, I, was just, I just recently had some, uh, maybe 20 minutes ago, from a very good friend, and uh, this is gross. there was a special, special place in Brooklyn where I ate mine from. Uh -huh. made it, and, uh, you know, they use the exact same uh, parameters as they... You know, it's an old tradition. Yeah. Now, really think. Does anyone know what gefilte fish is? Okay, gefilte fish is a traditional Ashkenazi Jewish fish, where basically all the crap of a fish ground up together with whatever you have left over, and you stuff it into this like skin. It's a sky. Oh, it's we we like it, but you should. But it's gross for for people who don't used to it. But a funny story because of the polar vortex, the Great Lakes froze over, and they've been unable to fish the fish. So there's actually a shortage of gefilte fish. I'm sure this is tormenting all of you, but there's a shortage. Okay. All right. Questions? Anything in your mind? What's anything on your mind? I appreciate I you know class on Monday, but I was home in New York. I had a very nice seder. Uh, anyone have any questions or things on your mind? Okay. So today is the last topic before we get to the First Amendment, and the topics for today didn't really fit anywhere else. Um, I tried, and I couldn't find anywhere else to fit them but I deem them important enough, so today's a hodgepodge day. So we're going to be talk about a couple main topics. The first one is procedural due process. Okay? This is the idea that before the government can deprive you of any kind of liberty or property interest, they need to give you a certain process or certain procedures. Right? This is the one that actually makes sense. The due process clause speaks of procedures, and that they forget procedures. So if Magna Carta meant anything, before you get your welfare benefits terminated, you have an evidentiary hearing. So this is what, this is what procedural due process is. The second topic which I'm actually going to start with is Article 4. And these are the various provisions that the states have to respect. And we've talked about a couple of these. We've talked about privileges and immunities. We've talked about full faith and credit. But I want to go through them in some detail. I'll start with that in a minute. And the final power we don't doesn't really fit anywhere else, which is the treaty power. And we'll talk about that somewhat briefly. But what's the power of the federal government to make treaties? And the more important question is, if they make a treaty... Does that enhance or add to the power of what the federal government can do? Jarrett's are shaking his head no. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. You can correct that just as Holmes later for another reason. So first, though, I want to start with a clause which you probably never even thought of other than the first day of class, which is the property clause. Yes, there is, in fact, a property clause in the Constitution. I hope you all learn about it in property class. We, you will in my class. So what's the property clause? Okay, so it's in Article 4. And I'll scroll up to see the, the entire thing. So Article 4, Section 3. This governs how states are admitted to the Union. Of course, we started with 13 states, and we added more, and now we have 50 states. How do you add states to the Union? So it says very clearly, new states may be admitted to Congress, uh, by, by Congress. Okay. A couple limitations, though. One state can't be formed by the junction of two or more states. The other part, which is interesting, nor can you form a state within another state, right? So, of course, this leaves poor West Virginia. Now, if any of you know the history of the Civil War, at some point after the Civil War broke out, you had Virginia, which obviously seceded. You had a bunch of uh, uh, sympathizers with the North in Wheeling, Virginia, which is kind of the north northern part. And they said, hey, Congress, we want to be our own state. We are the legitimate government of West Virginia. And Congress is like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, we need another state. Yeah, go for it, go for it. That's arguably unconstitutional. Virginia, uh, West Virginia is probably an unconstitutional state. Um, 
I'll leave, I'll leave it there, but there's actually a vigorous debate on whether they were constitutionally formed. Um, in fact, there's actually a proposal now you may have seen to split California into five states, which is absolutely not going to happen, but it's also probably unconstitutional as well. Probably. Okay. But the, uh, the provision I want to talk about here, though, is relevant to what's going on now. I'll explain in a minute. So it says, the Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules, re regulations regarding the territory or other property belonging to the United States. Now, where do we see this clause before? We saw it in Dred Scott, right? We saw it in Dred Scott, where it was argued that the uh, territory clause, this property clause, gave Congress the power to pass the Northwest Ordinance, which banned slavery in, in various parts of the country, right? But for our purposes, it's an interesting thing because something that happened this past week in Nevada, which some people might have emailed me about. So I'm talking about the Bundy Ranch. And I swear I didn't plan this, but this is a, and actually a couple of you emailed me about this, a perfect discussion of the property clause and also the supremacy clause. So I'll give you some background on what happened. So when Nevada entered the Union in 1846, okay, when it entered the Union, significant portions of the state were owned by the federal government. In fact, to this day, the federal government owns 80% of the land out west, right, of, of the territory, so to speak. I mean, basically, the entire state of Nevada, other than like Las Vegas and Reno, is owned by the feds. Um, and according to this ownership, if you go back to the property clause, <laughs> they provide various rules and regulations of how this land can be used. So an agency was created called the Bureau of Land Management, BLM. You might have seen the hashtag. So BLM which was responsible for managing the land in these territories, in these federally owned lands. And one way in which they regulate this is by charging fees for grazing of cattle. And in Texas, we know what grazing cattle is. I don't have to explain that. It might otherwise. All right? So what's the problem? Uh, question there? Yeah, I'll be record everything's recorded. Okay. Yeah, yeah, everything's recorded. So what happened? So you had a rancher, a guy named Clive and Bundy, no relation to Al, who has been his, his family has been farming the same land for 160 years uh, uh, before uh, Nevada was even a state, and he had been grazing his cattle there for generations upon generations. And at some point, there was a species of endangered turtle, the, the desert horse, which I'm sure none of you've ever heard of, but there was an endangered turtle that was found to be on that land. Okay. And as a result, the Bureau of Land Management starts saying, you can't graze here, you can only graze here. All right? And Mr. Bundy starts to ignore him very, very clearly. And then they start charging him fines for grazing this area. And those fines are probably over a million dollars. And Bundy basically said, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to follow it. Okay? Now, as is often the case, his reason for not following them is legal in nature. And it's fascinating. Even the most, um, I, don't really, I don't want to use a pejorative word, but even those dedicated people to causes are always able to find some sort of legal argument to support them. So what's his argument? Twofold. One, he doesn't recognize the property clause, right? He doesn't recognize the property clause. He says very clearly the federal government has no power to manage this land. He said the federal government, quote, has no jurisdiction on this grazing land. He says this land belongs to we the people of Clark County, Nevada. At the moment of statehood, right, he says this was still going to be owned by Nevada. As a citizen of that county, Clark County, Nevada, I abide by all state laws. So what he's basically saying is that this provision of the Constitution is unconstitutional, right? That I only follow state law, and under state law in Nevada, I can graze my cows here. Okay? So what's the, what, what's the, 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 the problem with that, right? The, the, the main problem with that is that it has to ignore large chunks of the Constitution, right? He thinks that the state is sovereign and that the federal government has no power over the land. And now you know that's probably not a very good argument because uh, the feds have that, okay? So by itself, Mr. Bundy doesn't have very strong legal legs to stand on. In fact, this case has gone to court over the last two decades, and he's had two courts of appeals decisions rolling against him, saying he needs to move these cows. Okay, so that's that's like the constitutional stuff. But 
But, but then, as I like to say, stuff got real, right? How, what I mean is this stuff gets real. So I have some pictures here of the standoff. Um, of the standoff, okay? Where is it? It was a picture from being tased. I can't find it. Anyway, this is a good picture. I love this picture. So what happened? Federal agents showed up and started impounding his cows, right? They started, I don't know how you do that, how you impound a cow. But they started rounding up the cows and herding them to these areas, okay? As you can imagine, a lot of people got pissed off at this. And a lot of state militias, right, state militias mobilized. And you had people from all over the country going to Nevada to this farm heavily armed, right? And I'm not talking about any kind of organized government militia. I'm talking about people called the militia from Montana and Idaho and New Hampshire and all over the country. And they show up armed to the teeth. They're carrying AR-15s. They are, they are fully armed. Here's this one picture, right? This dude, right? <laughs> he's a sniper. And he's sitting on a bridge monitoring the situation to make sure no one gets shot. Right, because if someone gets shot, he will open fire. All right, so you actually had a standoff between the BLM, which apparently has trained snipers. I don't know why, but the BLM has snipers, and these guys. And one of these guys got tased quite quite badly. Remember, don't tase me, bro. Right, right. So, it's, yeah, yeah. One of the rancher's sons got tased. Uh, I can't find the picture. I'll find it in a minute. <laughs> the dudes in the woods with AR-15s. So. What happens now, okay? So initially, it wasn't clear what was going to happen. Initially, the BLM continued to impound the cattle, and you had more of these people who were self-described militia members going to confront the federal government. Now, before you get excited, and some of you Texans are getting, yeah, just, <laughs> just, I can see it. Bear with me for a minute. We'll walk through this, I promise. There was a standoff where you had people who were heavily armed confronting federal agents, okay? These federal agents had a court order. Several courts of appeals had ruled that the Bundys must vacate this land, that they had no legal claim to stay there. Okay? This is when stuff gets real, right? You had one of these guys, Sheriff Mack, who is a leader of a group called the Oath Keepers. Now, you've you known about him because he was one of the guys who brought the Prince for the United States suit. Remember Prince? This is the commandeering case. So the same sheriff that told the federal government, you can't make me run a background check on this guy buying a gun, went there. And his, his purpose was starting shit, to put, it, to put it mildly. He was on, you can watch, he was on Hannity, and he said, we were going to put the women in front to really show the effect of this violence. You know, screw Titanic, because men, women and children first. He put the ladies in front, you know, like, to, to deflect gunfire. Okay. So they were going to start some stuff, okay? So, so what happens now, right? What happens when you have a private organization willing to Flow the federal government, and you have hundreds of men on horses with rifles staring down federal agents. They outnumber the federal agents. I mean, I'm sure they can call for backup, but, but they outnumber them. And they had pallets of food, supply, and ammunition ready to go. But any of you who are from the Waco area, you know how this usually ends up. People die, right? So what happens now? Well, the, they declared victory because the BLM moved out. Um, they'll be back. They're probably just going to arrest him who's not paying attention. Okay? But there's a very strong point about government and reality, right? So we have the law, right? He's in the wrong. He violated a court order. The court order says you can't graze these lands. Okay. We can probably all agree to that. But now what happens people stop following the courts, right? We always raise this question. What happens when people stop following the courts? It's not just government, right? We think back to the Cooper v. Aaron case. This was a case from Little Rock. Right, where where the, uh, the governor of Ala uh, of Arkansas, I, I think uh, Lacey had, I'm sorry, uh, Lauren had done some research on this, right? Where basically you had governors in the South saying we're not going to follow court orders, right? We're going to stand in the courthouse, I'm sorry, in the school the school doorstep, right? We're going to go to the university and stop these federal agents. And what happens then, right? What happens? If people willingly flout the law. There's not one guy. These were hundreds of people. I think up to a thousand, though I don't believe their numbers. A thousand people standing there with rifles on bridges aiming at federal agents. What happens then? It doesn't end well, right? And why does it not end well? Because people usually end up dead, right? People will end up dead. If one of those guys on that bridge 
pulled the trigger once, fired one round, maybe he, thought he saw someone go for a gun, there would be a lot of blood in Clark County, Nevada. A lot. Because they would have called in reinforcements, they would have had helicopters there in five minutes, and you see a lot of dead Americans. Uh, there's no other way of saying this. Now, put yourself in the minds of these federal agents. They're now shooting people because of a desert tortoise. Yes, right. So we can all talk about the silliness of endangered species laws. I mean, the, the, the level with which endangered species are protected is, is stunning, especially when the government owns 80% of the land and can control it, right? Yeah. Did you look at did you hear about the Harry Reading? I don't want to, no, no, don't go there. I, I, no, no, we'll talk about that after class. Right? I knew I was going to say that. No, 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 okay. We'll go, the, the, that, that's InfoWars stuff, okay? Okay, so. So what happens now, right? And unfortunately, I, I didn't have time to include a union in the Second Amendment at the end of class, um, and because we, we ran out of time, and I apologize for that. So I'll, I'll, Go at it in a way that maybe some of you may not have considered it before. So in Heller, this was the big Second Amendment case. In Heller, District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court held that the Second Amendment uh, protects an individual right to keep and bear arms. Okay? And what was the purpose of that right? The purpose of that right was for self-defense of home and person, right? The ability to defend yourself. Okay? Now we often think of defending yourself as only against bad guys, right? criminals, robbers, rapists, whatever, right? You can use self-defense to protect yourself. And you say this in criminal law, I'm sure, with the laws of self-defense. Um, one of the alternate understandings of the Second Amendment, which is compatible with that, is, is what one judge called the anti-doomsday provision. Right? This is a judge called Alex Kaczynski. This is when things get really bad, right? Then you need your guns. So Alex Kaczynski grew up in, in, the, in the Soviet Union, I think in... Uh, Bulgaria, he was the judge, and he was very familiar with the idea of dictatorships disarming people. Uh, there's a great book that just came out called The, uh, the Third Reich and Guns, or something like that, which discusses at great length how Nazis seize firearms as one of their first steps before rounding up Jews, and you actually had Jews who were arrested for not giving up their guns. Shame on them, right? So I'll leave you with this thought, and we can talk about it maybe, uh, maybe a little bit later. Uh, about the, the role the Second Amendment plays in the right to bear arms when you have something approaching a tyrannical government. Now, we know that Jefferson wrote in Declaration that we only revolt when we have, uh, we don't revolt for light and transient <laughs> causes, is what Jefferson wrote in the Declaration. So, uh, I, I'm not making any endorsement whatsoever about the activities that went on in, in Utah, I'm sorry, Nevada, and whether that was reason to have a full on assault on federal officers, right? Where these guys are cheering victory. And, uh, you know, people standing on bridges uh, uh, with, with with sniper rifles trained on federal officers. Um, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind whenever discussing uh, uh, disarming uh, uh, people. Um, the what the heck is that? That's not what I'm looking for. The, the history of this, though, is usually the fact that before tyrannies take over, when the first thing they do is disarm the people. It's it's a historical fact. So um, people don't like talking about that aspect of the Second Amendment, but it's something which uh, should be kept in mind. Now, I think a lot of these guys are absolutely freaking crazy. Um, uh, they, uh, <laughs> they, they, they were walking into their Alamo, right? They were launching, I'm actually going to San Antonio on Friday, I'm going to see the Alamo. But, but a bunch of people wanted this to be their Alamo, right? They wanted to have a stand, and they wanted to perhaps martyr themselves, or maybe the women first, I suppose, to, uh, uh, to, <laughs> to, to make a point. Um, and then put your eyes in the mind of the BLM soldier saying, wow, am I going to pull a trigger against my fellow citizen for a tortoise? And then, and then you realize when stuff gets really bad, when the government agents aren't going to be pulling the trigger. And that's when stuff really starts falling apart. So that's why I'm much more comfortable with people obeying silly court orders protecting desert tortoises than with armed insurrection in the, in the deserts of Nevada. Yeah? <laughs> You have to wait for them to pass? You know, the, know what they need, right? A hair to, to, to motivate it. Because a slow and steady wins the race. Ah, there it is, there it is. Right. Thank <laughs> you.
Jared? No, I, I just your, say your hand was up at I, some point, I'm sure. I believe the, uh, <laughs> the solar panels that are going to be going up in that area are going to be too, too mindful of the tortoise. But we'll, we'll see about that later. Yeah. Hey, the question, though, I mean, obviously, I don't know if it applies to the federal agents. It's, it's, it's not his purview, but is there another way to rectify the situation and come back to pay all? I mean, what, what, would, you, what would be your proposed alternative? I, I I don't have an answer to your question. So it's, it's, it's a very good question. Like, how do you how do you resolve this kind of standoff, right? So I mean, we can talk about the policy arguments. Why does the federal government own eighty percent of the land in the West, right? Why do they need to? Why are they putting on these onerous rules that? I mean, they're not just putting rules on grazing. They're driving the the ranchers out of business. They were I think a, a twelve ranchers in this area a few years ago. Now there's one left, and basically he can't do it. I mean. I'm not a farmer, but when you tell someone you can't graze your cattle, that means you can't keep them because they can't eat, right? They, they need to eat grass somewhere to survive. So by saying you can't graze them, that's like saying you, you go out of business, right? So I, I, I would say that the, the, the answer, I would hope, is to for the government to, to relinquish this land and surrender it and to pass its own regulations, but we know there's no, no mechanism. And the courts have effectively blessed this ownership of the land. They've read this property clause to be uh, fully encompassing. They can do whatever they want. Yeah. I doubt very, I, I doubt some of the federal officers are so happy. You know, I mean, they get hyped up and they really think it's, that it's uh, anarchy or in their head there's, it's something else other than fertile. Well, there is a rule of law issue, right? So, so the, the, the question is, the feds retreated it here, right? What happens to the ranch in Utah? I read there's another one in Utah, the same situation. What happens to the ranch in Utah? 2,000 guys show up because they know they're not going to open fire, right? And then you have another ranch in, you know, Arizona. 3,000 people show up. You have something in Montana, right? 5,000 5, people show up. And then you have, like, a legitimate force, like, like you basically have a regiment of an army, like, mustering and, and, and regulating themselves to fight against the federal government. I, I um, it's, this is when stuff, when, when people say, I will not follow a court order, and if you fire me, I have 5,000 men behind me who also fire at you, right? Uh, this is a, this, this is, this is real con law. This is when stuff gets very, very real. I don't have an answer. That's why I like people who follow court orders, right? This is why I think it's very important when the Constitution says something, you follow it, right? When it says you shall do this, you follow it. When the court says do this, whether or not I agree with it, you should follow it. Because if you don't, then then we have this, right? They have the dude in the bridge with the sniper rifle. I mean, can you imagine like if his fingers slipped, like if he got excited, I mean, or, or if like he thought he saw one of those agents reaching for something? I mean, it would have been a bloodbath. It, I mean, it would have been an absolute bubble because they would have opened fire, they would have killed the agents because they outnumbered the number of agents there, and then they would have sent for reinforcement. Uh, anyway, anyone else want to comment? I, I know, I know, denial of social security benefits is so much more interesting than this, but uh, anyone else? Yeah. Who's responsible for passing the BLM that they can't because the turtle who passed that was it an administrative agency? Of course. Which one? Uh, it's Department of the Interior, I think. I think the Interior Department. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Endangered Species Act, and, and I, I said this in my property class, they got mad at me. But what's the first thing you do if you find an endangered species in your property? Bury it. <laughs> That's why you bury it. It's a, it's a horrible thought. And it's not that I hate animals. I love animals. I, I actually do. But the, the amount of uh, protection provided certain endangered species and the effect on everything else in life uh, it, I think is is very much out of whack. Um, so we we, 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 can, we can talk about how the desert tortoise spawned this dude with a sniper rifle on the on the bridge. All right. Anything else? Yeah. I, I don't know if you said to me, Jim, uh, but was it ever his property? Or how does he have rights to that? Right? He claims this was his family's property before statehood. He I mean, if you've you done any easements yet, he's basically claiming that he's been uh, uh, grazing this land for 170 years. And in property law, if you do something over and over again, you actually you gain a right to continue grazing it. So he's actually saying he was grazing this before statehood. Before, forget the BLM, right? His family was grazing before statehood. And he's been continuously grazing the same land. Yeah. Well, then why would he have this in Bradford's position? 
Well, usually you can't. She took property already. So usually you can't claim adverse possession against the government, the federal government. But he's claiming it's prior to statehood. So he actually got the prescriptive easement before he even started statehood. But that's a property thing, which we do next semester. Anyone else? So if he, uh, if he had just compensation from the feds. Oh, they didn't that. pay him anything. Yeah, no. They, what do you they, think if he, if he does get it? They do it, not well, why would the federal government pay him? The federal government claims they own the land, and he's only using it at their discretion, which they've withdrawn. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone else? All right, let's all right, let's go on to the procedural due process stuff. I, I appreciate that discussion. Um, I wasn't planning on doing this about the syllabus, but it, it fit in just just right with the uh, with the topic. Okay, so the, the question, there's, there's, a, there's a basement in the Alamo? Yeah. <laughs> Davy Crockett's son still living there with a poster on the wall or something, or no? Just a side note, I've been in public space and I've been in the Alamo. Yeah, I've been in the Alamo. Yeah, I've been in the Alamo. That's the Alamo. Wow. That's pretty stupid. I'm glad you can get shot. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean I've... I'm glad he didn't get shot, because I think someone might have done that. Okay. Anyway, I'll check out the basement. I'll remember. Okay. So, uh, Marge. <laughs> uh, I'll skip that last question. The, the question and the answer is yes, it will skew the entire electoral map significantly. It's, it's never going to happen. All right. So let's talk about procedural due process. Much more sexy, right? <laughs> right? So it's kind of weird. We spent, what? three weeks on the idea of substantive due process, the idea that, oh, come on, the due process clause protects certain um, substantive liberties, right? Uh, we talked about right to education, right to contract, uh, right to abortion, right to sodomy, right to maybe gay marriage, right? We, we've talked about all these various elements of substantive due process. But what was missing in that entire discussion was the most important word, Process, right? What what does the due process clause actually say? It says, nor shall any person be uh, jumping like this. Nor shall any person be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And we focus so much. What's that word liberty mean? What's that word liberty mean? But what about the word property? Right? The government can't deprive you of property without due process of law. So this raises you know two two questions. The first question is. What is property, right? What is the property that the government can't deprive you of? And then the second question is, if they are going to deprive you of that property, what constitutes or what is due process of law? To state it differently, what process is due before the government deprives you of property, right? What, pro what process, what procedures does the government owe you prior to taking away your property? Now, we've mentioned at various points the power of eminent domain. We'll, we'll, you'll talk about that in property, too, I hope. Um, eminent domain is also in the Fifth Amendment, and it says uh, private property shall not be taken but for just compensation, right? The government wants to use your property for some sort of public use. They have to pay you. But they don't just sit and write you a check, right? They don't just say, hey, check, go. There are processes they have to follow. They have to say that this land is being used for a public purpose. They have to have a trial to determine the fair market value. There is process. Process is the key. All right? So let's talk about other types of benefits. Okay? In the 20th century, the federal government has greatly expanded what people might call government benefits, government entitlement programs, welfare. And what you call it actually makes a difference. Right? If you call, say, welfare an entitlement, Right? That suggests that it's not really a kind of property interest. It suggests that this is something the government's giving to people to be nice, right? That no one has a claim to um, any kind of government benefit. Some people might say, what do you mean a person has a claim to a government benefit? It's, it's, at the, it's at the leisure of the government. They can give or take as they will. Okay? Others might argue that government benefits are not benefits. They're actually statutorily created rights. We even saw this in the Obamacare case. The, the government lawyer effectively said that Obamacare was a statutorily created right, that you now have a right by statute to health care. 
that by virtue of being an American, you have the right to Social Security. You have the right to pension. You have the right to uh, disability, right? Now, whichever side of the debate you come down on doesn't really matter because the Supreme Court did it for you, okay? In the 1970s, in a series of cases, the Supreme Court made very clear that Social Security benefits, welfare benefits, are property. This was what was called the new property, right? Not this old property like land that you could use to ranch your cattle. This is new property. This is, this is these government benefits which we're entitled to, and then the government can't take it away from us. This is our property. So put aside your, 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 your libertarian beliefs, whatever they may be, that a government benefit is a property interest. Okay, everyone okay with that? For purposes of the due process clause, government benefits Welfare, Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, I don't what food stamps, unemployment, whatever. Any sort of government benefit. If the government's writing you a check or handing you some sort of payment, that is a property interest. Everyone okay with that? You can disagree about it later, but for now that that's what the Supreme Court said and that, that's the rule. Okay. So that's question number one. The second question is. Before the government deprives you of that interest, before they take away that, that property interest, that welfare benefit, whatever it is, what process is due? What procedures must be given to you before taking away your property interest? Right, so this, this is the question of the first case, the uh, Matthews versus Eldridge case. Okay, so there were a couple cases in the 70s that were not in your book, but I'll discuss them a little bit. So the first one was called uh, Roth v. Board of Regents. Not, the facts of it aren't too important, but it's relevant. If you are an employee of the state, say you're a professor, and you're granted tenure, everyone knows what tenure is, it's effectively a protection for your job. Can a state university fire you without any, without any hearing? Remarkably, the Supreme Court said no. That if you are a state employee university professor, you're a state employee university professor, and you're given tenure or denied tenure, you are required to have a hearing before you can be fired. What do you mean a hearing? Yes, in fact, the court said in the, in the Roth v. Board of Regents case that you have a constitutional right to a hearing before you're fired. Now, that doesn't mean they can't fire you, but they have to go through this entire elaborate procedure before kicking you out the door. As you might imagine, this significantly increases the costs of employment because if it's harder to fire someone, you're stuck with people you might not want, and you can't hire new people, right? This, this is the dilemma of the tenure system, right? You want to protect academic thought. You want to give people freedom to say stupid things like I do every day. But you also protect people who might not be productive and might not be good teachers. This is, this is the never-ending debate over tenure. All right? But this is not just a tenure debate. The Supreme Court said this is constitutional. You have a constitutional right to this. Okay? That's one case. Second case is something called Goldberg versus Kelly, which was a 1970 three or four, I can't remember the year. Okay. Goldberg v. Kelly involved welfare benefits. Right? Person was receiving welfare benefits. And the state terminated those benefits. And they didn't give the person a hearing before they terminated them. They didn't give the person a chance to contest. Maybe they needed those benefits. Maybe they, 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 they weren't making any money. What did the Supreme Court hold in the Goldberg v. Kelly case? That you have a constitutional right to a hearing that looks like a trial before your welfare benefits are terminated. Think about that. Before the state, say for example the state finds that you lied about your income, say you're actually making more money, you're above the welfare cutoff, right? If the state finds that you lied about your income, they need to give you a hearing before they can take away your benefits, right? And after that hearing there's an appeal. And after that hearing there's another appeal. And after that hearing you can appeal to federal district court. And then you can build a court of appeals. This can go on for three or four years. And during the entire time, the benefits can't be taken away. So the Goldberg versus Kelly case was momentous. This was a huge deal. 
because it said before the government takes away any of your benefits, they need to give you a full evidentiary hearing. Lawyers and everything. You have the rules of evidence. You have to have witnesses. You can't rely on written submissions. This effectively constitutionalized welfare. What do I mean by that? It made it into a quasi-constitutional right. Because once you were given it, you basically could not have it taken away unless you had a really good reason and you proved it to a judge. This put under the thumb of the judiciary a whole swath of social welfare programs. Okay? This is a Brennan opinion, which would surprise no one, just as Brennan wrote Goldberg v. Kelly. But this was a really big deal because it, it, it basically would make social welfare benefits part of your constitutional rights. And a court can second guess the denial of welfare benefits. All right. Everyone okay with those two cases? The, the, it's uh, the Roth v. Board of Regents and the Goldberg v. Kelly. They, they mentioned them briefly in the, in the book, but they weren't listed as full cases. Okay. Everyone okay with that? Mm -hmm. So now we get to the uh, Matthews v. Eldridge case, which was 1975. Okay. Well, you wouldn't know it if you read it, but the primary purpose of Matthews v. Eldridge was to put the brakes on Goldberg v. Kelly. It pulled back with the courts in Goldberg, it, it severely narrowed the opinion in Goldberg. They went out of the way to say that's not what we're doing, but that's exactly what they were doing. It was like a quiet reversal, where they left it on the books, but they severely weakened it. So now the controlling standard for procedural due process cases is Matthews. Matthews v. Eldred is the test, if you call it that, for all procedural due process. All right, so what happened, what are the facts in, in Eldridge? Okay, so Eldridge was given some sort of benefits for disability uh, uh, in 1968, okay? And then a couple of years later, the state received some information to suggest that maybe he wasn't disabled. And I'll pause here to note, disability fraud is a really big deal. I'm sure everyone here knows someone who's on disability insurance right now probably isn't actually disabled. Okay, it, it, it's, it's, it, there are a lot of people who deserve it, and there's a significant number who abuse the system, which is very bad. Um, and invariably what happens is, unless a state finds out that they're not disabled, they're getting these payments for, for life. Okay? And it's not uncommon for people, for the state to hire investigators to go see someone playing golf who's supposed to be on disability. It's not uncommon. So for whatever reason, the state found out that maybe this guy wasn't disabled. So they requested more information from doctors. Right? And he, they gave some more records. And the state reviewed these records. And they told him that they made a tentative determination to cancel his benefits. And he has some you know, more time to file documents. And he disputes it in writing. They didn't give him a chance to appear in person. They gave him an opportunity in writing to contest the determination that his, uh, his benefits should be terminated. Okay? Based on the written submission loans, they said, we will terminate your benefits. And if you want, you can seek reconsideration in six months during which time no benefits would be paid. Okay, so what do we have? He was not given any sort of hearing prior to the termination of benefits. His only option was to appeal after the termination and to try and get a hearing before an administrative judge. Right, so the, the, the most direct impact of that format is that his benefits were terminated. He was not getting money, and then he has to live without it while he's appealing. Now, that's a significant hardship for a lot of people. In fact, in the dissent, they mentioned uh, that his home was foreclosed on during this time. And he was living with his family in a small one-bedroom apartment. Right? So it's not a joke when benefits are denied prior to giving a chance. Now, he did have some process. What process did he have? He could submit in writing, in writing an explanation of what the situation was. Okay? But he wasn't giving a hearing before an administrative law judge. Now, let me pause for a moment. Does everyone know what an administrative law judge is? ALJ. Okay? They're not really judges. right? So it, it's, almost, it's almost like a nice title to give someone, but they're not really judges. Why? Because they work for the agency. Right? I mean, 
it's by necessity, but administrative law judges work for the agencies. First. For example, you could be a Social Security judge who works for the Social Security Department, right? A Social Security agency. I'm not impugning their motives, but they have certain vested interests in cases being dismissed, and this, this is invariable. So you might think you're getting a fair hearing from a judge, but in, in some small respect, the judge is working the side of the agency, and you can't really avoid that. Um, eventually, if you don't like what the administrative law judge says, you can appeal it. And who are you appealing it to? Another judge in the Social Security Agency, right? So you're facing many people who work for the government trying to deny you benefits. Eventually, if all those things fail, you can always file in federal district court. And then you have an actual Article Three judge hearing your case. But that's very time consuming, it's very expensive, and it takes a long it takes a lot of effort and usually never gets that far. So most denials of social security are actually filed and they go through the process, but they don't go very far. Okay. So what happened? So the guy had his benefits denied. Did he seek this reconsideration in six months? No, he didn't. What did he do? He went to federal court and he challenged the validity of this proceeding. He challenged you. He says, you did not give me due process. I have a property right, which are my disability payments, and you didn't give me the appropriate process. Okay, so it's appealed. Government says, you got all the process you were due, buddy. All the process you were due, you got. You get nothing more. He also said, this case involves disability benefits. Okay? Now, this part is probably a little bit funny. So, in Goldberg v. Kelly, the court said, for welfare benefits, we need to have this hearing. You need to have a hearing for welfare benefits being denied. Why are welfare benefits different from disability benefits? Okay, so, so what did the government say? Well, welfare benefits are based on financial need. Disability benefits are not. Why is that silly, Cheryl? Well, it doesn't go with what they were saying. I mean, they said in order to qualify for it, you had to be unemployable. You had to be so physically impaired. You couldn't get a job, I think. Right, so the difficulty here, and I, th I think Cheryl has, has exactly the right point, is the government said, well, for welfare benefits, it's means tested. You can only get it if you're poor. But for disability, you might have money. Maybe you can appeal, maybe you can get by without getting your benefits while it's being appealed, right? But the definition of being disabled is you can't work. You can't have any job whatsoever. So I think Cheryl is there. I think the other reason is probably a little bit better is that usually disability turns on very um, distinct medical records, right? An x-ray usually doesn't lie. I mean, it can be interpreted different ways, but an x-ray of your you can't stand is fairly easy to understand. You don't need to cross-examine an x-ray. Or maybe if you have some sort of medical record showing that you can't have certain mobility, that's a, that's a fixed medical record. Welfare is very personal and emotional. You have to talk about your family situation, your kids, your wife, your husband, your, uh, your, your drug substance abuse problem, right? There are, a lot of, there are a lot of things involved in a decision for welfare that might not be present for disability. Okay, so th those are the reasons that, that the government identified to distinguish them. But, Cheryl, don't get upset. The reason why the court ruled against this guy was not because of that. It was because they wanted to reverse Goldberg v. Kelly, right? So they just narrowed it. Okay? So, so what happened here, right? The court said that these disability benefits were property interests, right? So they acknowledged that these were property interests, all right? But what was the appropriate level of process due? Right? Do you need some kind of hearing before the termination of benefits? And the key word here is before. Eldridge could have gotten, was it Matthews? I forget which one it is. The guy could have gotten a hearing, terrible names. The guy could have gotten a hearing after the benefits are terminated, but do you have a right to a hearing before? Right? So what is the primary cost of having a hearing before? Well, if he actually was entitled to the benefits, there was no need to have a hearing. But, say if he wasn't entitled to the benefits, this would significantly increase the cost of terminating benefits. You need to have a lot of time and effort to go through the process, hire lawyers, produce evidence. 
And I think it said in the case it took almost a year to go through these hearings. So now if you found someone was improperly obtaining government benefits, you now have to wait a year before you can terminate them. And that's money being paid up from the Treasury you're, you're probably not going to ever see back. Right, so that, that's the cost. <clears throat> so what does the court do? Oh, our favorite law student answer, they have a three-factor test, right? We all, we all love three-factor tests. They're not really factors, though. And the court didn't really apply them either, if you, in case you read, the, if you read the case closely. So what are these three factors? Well, the court begins by saying these are, these are flexible factors, right? We need to look at the government interests and the private interests, right? Right, the government interests and the private interests. Okay, so what's what's the first interest? The first one is, what is the private interest that's affected? Right, what private property interest is being affected? Okay, in this case, it's the disability benefits being paid out. Okay. The second factor looks to see how likely is it that the person might improperly be denied that benefit, right? Or as I say, what's the risk of an erroneous deprivation of such interest? Are the existing procedures adequate to prevent someone being improperly denied benefits? Or stated differently, is the process they have set up going to stop them from being denied benefits improperly? Right. Okay, and the third, the third issue, the third factor, is what's the government's interest, right? Is there fiscal burdens? Is there administrative burdens? If you give this guy more process, if you give him more hearings, we'll make it more difficult for the government to administer their funds. Right? So these three factors try to balance in a very interesting way the rights of the individual and the rights of the state. The first factor focuses exclusively on the individual. The third factor focuses exclusively on the state. And the second factor focuses on these procedural safeguards, right? How do we make sure that the individual is not improperly uh, deprived of his risk. Now, if you look at it like that, you say, wow, one and two are kind of for the benefit of the individual, and three is for the benefit of the state. If you look at it like that, you think, wow, the, this, this is great for the individual. The individual is always going to win here, right? Did the individual win in this case? No. Okay, why not? Because usually the third factor predominates. You know, if you have like a scale, right? The third factor, what's the government's interest? That's like the elephant, right? That's the big one. Because any decision impacting procedural due process doesn't just affect one person's disability benefits. It affects millions of people, right? If the court were to say, you need to get this hearing before, that would affect millions of people applying for disability benefits every year. And that imposes a huge administrative burden. That imposes a huge financial burden on the government. And it results in spending out lots of money on benefits that probably should not be paid while it's going through the appeals process. So while the court has this three-factor test, if, if you read the opinion, you, you get the sense that the last one's the most important. As, as Cheryl pointed out, they're not too concerned with, with, with this guy's income situation, right? That's not too important to them at all. And for the second factor, they seem fairly convinced that, that these additional safeguards they're giving this, this hearing before won't make things much better. Okay. Everyone okay with the, with the test? We got that? Yes? Typically with a third factor, the government is looking at things like are there fiscal or administrative burdens for more process? Yes. What is the cost of giving this guy a hearing, right? 
and not just the cost for this one person, but for the cost for everyone applying for the same benefits. And this is at the state level, it will be at the federal level, at the county level of being denied food stamps, right? By saying you need this hearing before, every level of government now needs to burden this cost. And invariably, here's a dirty secret, where does this money come from to defend these cases in, in, in court? Yes, and these decrease the amount of money going to people who are disabled. Right? So effectively, the government says, you shouldn't be getting these benefits. You're committing disability fraud. Now let's spend all this money defending our, our position so that other people can't get it. Right? So as much as we might want to help those, there's a cost because it decreases the fisc that can be spent for others. Um, there, are, there are going to be erroneous deprivations, right? There are going to be cases where a person is improperly deprived. But the court here took the position that we'll let the system work those out, right? For those rare cases, we'll let the system work it out. We'll let the guy get his house foreclosed in the meantime, but we'll let it work it out. We're not going to pose this for everyone. That's a very good point. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's not related directly, but it's the same idea. If one person does it, it's not that big of a deal. But if all these people are required to have this hearing, then it will cost a lot of money and take away from the uh, funding that can go to the uh, the actual disabled. Yeah. So they're actually moving these people from a permanent disability to possibly want to welfare, which is a temporary disability. Yes, and the court actually alludes to that. There's just one sentence that's pretty snarky. It's like, and they can apply for other uh, financial assistance while the, this is pending. Everyone, everyone see that? It's basically go on welfare. You get a hearing for that, right? Go on welfare while your social, while your, your disability benefits are being paid out. Um, and I mean, it's not a comparable substitute because disability and welfare don't cover the same things. Disability tries to approximate your income before you're working and what what job you're doing. Welfare is putting you to the poverty line, basically. Questions? All right. So the court walks through, and, and I mean, the process here is actually fairly elaborate. They give you basically many, 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 many steps to challenge a determination. Um, the key factor is everything's in writing. You don't get to go up in front of a, it's not a judge, person wearing a robe. They, they wear robes, right, for show. You don't get to go up in front of a person wearing a robe and make your case, you know, like Judge Judy or something, right? Mm -hmm. Judge Judy's more of a judge in the LJs. So you don't get to make your case for the ALJs, right? You get to just do things in writing. And there's many levels of review, right? So the court walks through those three factors, um, and, and they, they're effectively saying, yeah, there's a property interest here, and yeah, I'm sure these additional safeguards we're giving this hearing would make things better, but it's not worth the cost. It's not worth the cost. Not worth the cost. Or stated differently, it's not for us, the courts decide to impose this cost. If the government wants to create this process, they can do that, but we're not going to require them to do this. It's up to the government to decide how they spend their own money in this context. Okay, two questions on, on that case. Right. So wh why did I bother assigning this case? Because if any of you ever do any kind of disability work or any kind of social security appeals, you'll need to know this. There are cases where the court finds violations of procedural due process, right? Say, for example, a process says X and the government doesn't comply with it. Like, say they're supposed to give you some sort of review and they skip a step, right? Then you have a case. They have to actually stick by their own processes. So this, this does come up if you do any kind of employment or labor law. So Bury this case in the back of your mind, and one day you'll remember Eldridge. All right. All right. Questions on this case? Can we move on? No. Yes. What about the fact that these administrative agencies are are basically performing all three functions of the government mm -hmm. together? Do we have any other cases on administrative agencies, or is this going to be the only one? Well, we've done remember? several. Remember Schechter Poultry? Remember Shrek Poultry? Delegation Doctrine? Yeah, we did that. Yeah. So, Melissa, uh, Melissa, Cheryl's question was, what's the problem with these executive branch agencies exercising the legislative, right, the judicial, 
and the executive function, right? They're passing regulations to decide who gets these benefits. They're having some sort of people in robes pretend to be judges to decide whether it's fair or not. And then they have people actually enforcing the laws by collecting these fines and handing out payments, right? Is there a problem with Congress delegating to an administrative agency these powers? And what has the court said? The court said we defer to you. You're the expert. Not my problem. You're young, yes. So we've got all these administrations. I remember at the beginning of class you said that it's creating the virtual fourth arm of government. Yes. And that's very true. I mean, we've got all these. I mean, that's the whole uh, Bundy case right there. You know, you've got all these people that are judge, jury, and executioner. And, I mean, that's a bad with people with sniper rifles. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what happens, though, when people feel like, I mean, I'll talk to you. Okay. <laughs> well, I think... I think I, I sense your frustration, and, 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 the, and the fact is this was, this was a, a product of the New Deal. Um, the entire purpose of the New Deal was to create these administrative agencies that could, with expertise, govern, right? So that way you wouldn't have to have members of Congress making decisions about Social Security benefits, and you wouldn't need to clog the federal courts with all these Social Security appeals. But by doing that, they've created this, uh, this other branch of government which is not, in, this, in a sense, constitutional in the sense of the classical sense, but they are still bound at least by the procedural due process. They still need to follow certain processes. But if the courts defer to every process that they do, and they can come out and with a decision like this, and they do it over and over every day, they, they, they can imprison, they can fine, they can shut your business down depending on whether they're OSHA or CLIA or whoever they are, then um, they're not elected, they're appointed for life a lot of times. I mean, you know, Humphrey's executor and all that business. I mean, what's going on? Hmm. Well, this is our post-New Deal world. Um, say it simply. The, the, the fact of the matter is it's a problem of, uh, of deference where the uh, courts will defer to the administrative agencies. And well, here's what's interesting. It's actually, it's actually a form of double deference, so, so follow me here, right? The courts say, we trust Congress to exercise our constitutional duty. We will trust Congress, right? And the Congress says, we will defer to the courts what we can do. Right? So Congress is deferring to the courts, and the courts are deferring back to Congress. It creates this loop of deference that, that ends, I don't know, actually keeps going. But, but, but th th this, is, this is the effect, if, if you say, you said, when you, when you no longer enforce the idea of separation of powers in, in the delegation doctrine, then, then, then these agencies make a lot of sense. Melissa, your hand was up. Oh. No, never mind. Other questions? Yeah. Just a minute. Well, check your poultry. Yeah, we did this earlier in the year with the delegation doctrine. It's in there. 1934, ALA Schechter versus poultry. It was actually, it was actually a, a kosher case. It was funny. These are these brothers in Brooklyn who had a kosher butcher shop, and uh, FDR passed the, uh, uh, the National Recovery Act, and part of it, which had very strenuous restrictions on how these butcher shops could be run, and as a result, they basically tried shutting down this kosher butcher shop because they weren't complying with these rules. I'm pretty sure that, that the kosher slaughter process was actually inconsistent with what FDR wanted. So that's why you had these administrative boards, this is the kosher example, right? You have the administrative boards making processes that kosher butchers can't comply with. But Supreme Court said 9-0, Congress can't delegate to these agencies the legislative power to make these rules. But that case was reversed. Kind of. Yep. Uh, is it a political question? Well, that's actually a good question. Couldn't the courts just say, this is up for the administrative agencies to decide. You know, this is a political question. It's not for us. Probably not. I mean, I, I think it's probably right. The government can't give you something and take it away from you arbitrarily. I think it's due process is probably the right standard here. All right. Questions? All right. Let's run through Article 4. And I gave you a not a very long reading, but it has uh, some of the provisions which, which I want you to be familiar with. They're not too, too important, but... I don't want you leaving class without talking about them. Uh, so the first one is called the Full Faith and Credit Clause. And we've discussed this in the context of the Defense of Marriage Act. So, so this clause is meant to ensure that if you have a judgment in one state, then that judgment will be respected in another state. Also, if a law is passed in one state, it will be recognized in another state. This is, this, is your, this is your tort action, right? You get into a car crash in another state, and then you sue in your home state, right? 
your home state will be required to follow the law of the place where the car accident occurred. Right? They can't just simply ignore it. Okay. Uh, section 2. We've talked about this one a lot. This is a privileges and immunities clause. Right? This is the idea that there are certain fundamental rights that states can't violate. So the classic example, one state can't pass a law to exclude out-of-staters from working there. Right? So I think it was New Hampshire passed a law saying that if you want to be a lawyer, you need to, have a, you need to live in New Hampshire. Prevent all those Bostonians from crossing over. Not so Boston strong, right? So what happened? The Supreme Court invalidated it. The Privileges and Immunities Clause protects a fundamental right to work, and uh, a state can't uh, discriminate against out-of-staters. There was actually just a case about this like two weeks ago, where New York tried passing a law saying that if you want to be a licensed lawyer in New York, you need to keep an office in New York. If you want to practice in New York, you have to keep an office in New York. And then the, the court found that that was invalid. They can't require you to do that. Okay. Yes. How is the privileges and immunity clause different from the privileges or immunity clause? Ah. Well, the first one says the first one respects uh, uh, discriminating against out of staters, right? So there were certain certain fundamental rights, for example, the right to work, that you can't treat your own citizens one way and other citizens differently. Okay. The 14th Amendment's Privileges or Immunities Clause protects a similar set of rights from state infringement, right? So uh, the difference is this is something against discriminating against out-of-staters. But the basis of the Privileges or Immunities directly relates back to these Privileges and Immunities. They're not the same, but they're, they're viewed in a very similar fashion. Okay? We also have here things I won't mention much, which are the Extradition Clauses. These, these discuss the ability to... Uh, uh, if you have some criminal uh, criminal who flees to a state, the, the governor of that state is required to send the uh, the criminal back. We also have the fugitive slave clause, which which is no longer in effect, but used to require that anyone who finds a slave would be required to deliver the slave to that person's master, uh, not just to the state. Okay, we have the state admission clause. We talked about this with Mr. Bundy. What can I just marry with children? I, I, I got to think about this case with all of Al Bundy and married with children, but I know that's, that's not right. Okay. Love and marriage, yeah. Uh, we have the Article Four Guarantee Clause, Republican form of government. We talked about this with respect to the Luther v. Borden case. Remember, this was a case where there was a revolution in Rhode Island, and the government couldn't tell which was the actual legitimate government at the time in Rhode Island. They, they, they didn't know. Um, so the court has said effectively that this is a uh, political question, that the court won't decide whether a state has a Republican form of government. But everyone, every state has that guarantee. And uh, this is a, a nice segue into the case of Texas versus White. Now, Texans here, did you ever say this case at any point in, in middle school or high school or something? I guess they would not include this book in your textbook, would they? A, a case that says Texas never did secede. Uh, <laughs> No, that wouldn't be here. Okay, so let's <laughs> okay, let's talk, let's talk about Texas v. White for a moment. All right, so the idea of secession is very um, uh, difficult. Why? Well, because our nation began as an act of secession. Right, thirteen colonies, which part of the British Empire, said, "Screw you, King George, we're on our own." We declared our independence, and we fought a war over it. And after the war, uh, we were a nation. But what actually makes a sovereign nation, you might ask? Well, generally in international law, other countries have to recognize you. What does that mean, recognize you? Other countries have to treat you as an independent nation. right? If other countries don't recognize you as a nation, then you're probably not a nation. So if any, any of you have followed what happened in Ukraine recently, uh, an entire portion of Ukraine, Crimea, seceded and basically joined the Russian Federation, right? So, which is the legitimate government in Crimea? Was it the elected government from Ukraine, or was it these Putinists put in place uh, uh, to, from Russia? It's an open question, right? Even in the American Revolution, after we declared our independence, 
not every country recognized it. It should come as no surprise to you that England did not recognize our independence. They sent troops instead, right? But France recognized as a nation. At some point, Spain eventually did, and other nations did. So the, the, so the political question of when does a country secede is largely based on who's recognizing that country as a sovereign nation. When the Confederacy seceded, did any other nations recognize them? Yeah. Spain did. I think France did too. And someone can correct me, but I think a number of nations actually started engaging in commerce with the Confederate States of America. They wanted their cotton, right? So a lot of countries actually engage in commercial relations with the South. Now, did the Union ever recognize the secession of the South? Much like King George, the answer is no, right? So what did Lincoln say? All right, what did Lincoln say? He said, there's no, there's no secession, right? The states never seceded. There is just domestic violence, right? There is just some sort of insurrection or rebellion in these states. They're just misbehaving. They're still states. Don't worry about them, right? But his argument actually had a constitutional footing, right? So I showed you a minute ago the property clause, which provided how states can enter the union, right? Is there anything in the Constitution about how states can exit or leave the union? Trust me, the people in Austin are looking for it for a while. It's not there, right? There's, there's nothing in the Constitution which permits a state to exit the Union. In fact, Lincoln reads this clause to say each state is guaranteed a Republican form of government, meaning they will always have this form of government, meaning they can't leave, right? What if one state wants to secede and form a monarchy? Could they do that? Lincoln says no. Now, how can a constitution bind a state from actually leaving the Union? I mean, the Article of the Confederation called it a, quote, perpetual union. That's what word used, a perpetual union. Our Constitution says we started with a perpetual union. We're going to form a more perfect union, right? What can be more perfect than perpetual? Forever, right? What's cooler than cold? Ice cold, right? What can be more perfect than... There we go. What can... Make sure you're paying attention. Actually, outcasting is having a reunion, right? So what can be... What can be more... Perfect, forever union, okay? But now, we talked about Bundy, it's actually relevant, stuff gets real, right? What happens when you have a state, South Carolina, fire at a, at a federal fort in Fort Sumter, right? What happens when you have federal, I'm sorry, so, uh, Confederate troops mustering, getting their rifles, and opening fire on federal officials, right? What happens when you have entire states in the Union saying, we no longer follow federal law? I didn't intentionally assign Bundy and Texas versus White today, but the sentiments are actually in a, in a, in a similar plane. Now, I'm not comparing the two in the least. Uh, please, please don't get me wrong. Um, but when you have people who are willing to not follow federal authority, maybe they have good reasons, maybe they have bad reasons. This is when stuff gets messy, right? And this is, of course, we had a civil war. We had these states who were trying to uh, secede and, and separate and fight to preserve their, 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 their sovereignty in the way they defined it. And then you had northern states that you guys can't leave, you're part of us, right? And we'll kill you till you come back in. Yeah. So, what happens? So why the heck was this case even in the Supreme Court, right? Why was the Supreme Court even considering the secession issue? Well, bonds, right? During the Civil War, the, 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 um, the, the, the Austin Capitol, they switched flags. So now they have a Confederate flag, right? Was that flag number, that was flag number six, right? That was the sixth flag. So in Austin, they, you know, they, they, they changed the flags. Like, all right, Confederate now, guys. And they said, we will basically seize all the bonds issued by the federal government. They, they seized them as, as basically confiscated property. The same manner in which Lincoln seized the slaves in the Emancipation Proclamation, the, the, the capital, the Texas legislature in Austin seized these bonds. So then you have some guy named White trying to sue for the return of his bonds. And that's how the case gets to the Supreme Court. So the question arises then, did Texas ever actually leave? 
right? Now, what are the two options? If Texas was still a state, right, could Texas pass a law basically canceling federal bonds? Of course not. The supremacy clause says they can't. This is almost like Mar uh, McCullough, where they're trying to put a tax on a federal bank. If Texas was still a state, they can't cancel these federal bonds. So the, the act was void, and the guy would have to be paid out. All right? But if Texas seceded, if Texas was a sovereign state, don't applaud, right? If Texas was, was a sovereign state, they'd be free to cancel those bonds because they're no longer bound by the supremacy clause, right? This is Mr. Bundy's argument that Nevada is not bound by federal law. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a terrible argument, but this is the argument. I mean, Nevada hadn't seceded yet, right? But Texas said, we seceded. We're not bound by your constitution. So at heart, what this case was about is, was Texas still bound by the Supremacy Clause? Were they still bound by federal law? And the Supreme Court said, in an opinion by Chief Justice Chase, who was Lincoln's former Treasury Secretary, the only justice on a piece of currency is on a, is on a bill I showed it to you before. Chief Justice Chase said, Texas never left, therefore Texas was always bound by the law of the United States. Well, what happened to McCullough? Maryland tried taxing the federal notes in the bank, mm -hmm. and that was unconstitutional, right? Here, basically, Texas tried canceling out federal bonds. It's not, it's not the same issue, but, but they're trying to do the same thing. You know, the Supremacy Clause, you can't do that. All right, the other issue McCulloch was, did they have the power to charter the bank at all, which, which was the primary issue. Okay? So he walks through, which is actually a very interesting document, a very interesting opinion. There's not much con law in the sense that you mean it, but he's basically setting the stage for Reconstruction, right? So, let's, so, so think about it this way. If Texas never actually left, they were just in rebellion, that means once hostilities are over, Texas is a state again, right? Mm -hmm. And that would mean that Texas is required to send members to Congress and senators to Washington. Mm -hmm. Did that happen? No. Okay. What? Did the elected members of the Texas legislature get to sit? No. So this was Reconstruction, right? Mm -hmm. Reconstruction said, okay, Texans, you lost. You never left the Union, but you lost, and you can't establish the government you want. We'll, we'll put in a provisional government. We will install a provisional governor. Does anyone know if the provisional governor has his, has his portrait hanging in the rotunda? I'm guessing not. You know, in Austin, they have every governor uh, his portrait hanging in the rotunda. I'm positive that the provisional governor does not have his portrait hanging. Uh, I will check that next time I'm in Austin. No? Yeah, I, yeah. Anyway, so basically Lincoln installed a provisional governor in Austin. They installed a provisional legislature. They were not allowed to send members to Washington of Congress or the Senate. Okay? They didn't hold any elections. Right? So how could it be if Texas is a state, and always was a state, that they're now being deprived of their sovereignty to send members to Washington and elect their own governments and have their own laws? Right? So what this opinion was basically doing was establishing a legal theory by which the, the Union could slowly bring Texas back into the fold. I'm sure Texas would want to go back the other way, but they can slowly pull Texas back into the fold. So what does the court say? We have an indestructible Union. It's indestructible. And in order to have the union, we need to have the states all together. Right? At some point, Texas had the question of statehood. Right? They made their decision to become a state. Here's my favorite line of the opinion. Quote, and it was final. Everyone see that? And it was final. Sorry, boys. Right? And it was final. You make that choice once. You enter the Union, you don't leave. Right? The Union between Texas and the other states was complete, perpetual, and indissoluble. Sorry, Rick Perry. There's no chance reconsideration, right? 
no chance of revocation. So estates cannot leave. What about the people of Texas voting to secede? There were actually resolutions in Texas to secede. Those were null and void. They were null and void. The obligation of every citizen of Texas was still to the Union. Could have, could have fooled them with their rifles, but they, their obligation was still to the Union. All right? So, Texans, you were always part of the Union. You never left. Sorry. You can rewrite your history books now, okay? But that doesn't dissolve the issue. Why not? Even though the obligations were the same, the court says, the relations, the relations changed. What does that mean the relations were changed? Well, Texas was controlled by a hostile government. So that can't be a legitimate government. Because that government didn't have relations with Washington, it's an invalid government. The rights of the people to even elect those governments were invalid. Because the people themselves were not were hostile to the United States. That's a lovely thought. Texas was always a state, but it misbehaves. And because it misbehaved, we can't let them have all the benefits of being a government. We can't let them elect their own representatives. We can't uh, allow them to send members to Washington. The Texas legislature can't appoint senators, right? This We can't have this. Right? But you might ask, Josh, the war's over, right? Lincoln had the power to do whatever during the war, but the war's over. You know, the Potomacs, right? They, they declared surrender, right? Isn't the war over? The power to reestablish your relations is ongoing. Why? Guarantee clause. There is a guarantee to Texas to give them a Republican form of government. And as we know, the court won't decide what the Republican form of government is. Congress does. So until the president and the Congress think that they have the right government, they can actually occupy and be a, 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 a reconstructive force to push them in that direction. Yeah, the war of northern aggression. I had never heard that word until I went to law school in Virginia. I was like, what the hell, war of northern aggression? Oh, that war of northern aggression, right? Yeah, it's true. Coffee, is it true? So they actually do hung, they do hang up the provisional governor's portrait. That's interesting. And he was he was appointed by the feds, right? Uh, that that's surprising. Okay, he's always all the way at the tippy top, right? No, no, but no, but wouldn't wouldn't Austin be up first? They hung him or his portrait. <laughs> Uh, I mean, actually, the way the way you wrote that, I mean, actually, I think the difference is hung is for a portrait and, and hanged. No, hanged is for a person, and hung is for a portrait, right? So, so you're correct grammatically. Okay, so the question, right? Why, why wasn't this a political question? It probably should have been, right? But I think, I think Chief Justice Chase, who again was in Lincoln's cabinet, he was his Treasury Secretary, was trying to establish. A, a, a reasoning for occupation and a reason for the reconstruction process. That, that's what he was <laughs> trying to do. And his opinion actually makes the case uh, fairly clearly. Okay? Right, so what are then the limits on this, on this guarantee clause power? Well, very broad. He says it must have the, the means must be necessary and proper uh, to restore the states. So anything necessary, basically, to bring back a Republican form of government, the states can do. And the provisional government can continue doing this, even after the war is over. Uh, until they get to a Republican form of government, as decided by the, by the United States. Right, so, so what's this case saying? Texas, you never left, but because you misbehaved, we can, we can make sure you get a government back in order. And this wasn't just in Texas. Texas was, of course, 
Texas is always the test case, right? But there's also Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. The, basically, the entire American South was under reconstruction for quite some time. Um, uh, the, the, the sad part is that as one, <laughs> once Reconstruction ended, Jim Crow began, right? So but once left to their own devices, Texas didn't exactly uh, comport itself very well. Um, so there's that also. <laughs> All right, questions on the Texas versus White case? So questions on Texas in general? Yeah. What happened to the, um, to the constitutional obligations of Texas while they were in the war? Well, there was no constitutional taxes at that point. That was but but what? Well, let me ask you this question: What constitutional duties did a state have at that point before the Fourteenth Amendment? What parts of the Constitution apply to the states at that point? Well. Which which article of the Constitution, which was in our reading today, <laughs> control of the states? Article four, right? So to answer your question, technically the states were still bound by the fourth by Article four, right? They were required to give effect to northern laws. They were required to uh, not discriminate against out staters. Although if someone from New York walked into Georgia, they'd probably be shot, right? But I mean, you know, there was a war. There was an active war going on, but. To Lincoln, there was never a war. Lincoln always said this was an insurrection. There was never a war. It's an interesting thought experiment. What would have happened if, like, you know, the South, you know, didn't lose? It just reached a stalemate, right? Can you imagine how our country would develop with two nations on one continent? It's a fascinating thought experiment. I, I, I don't, I can't imagine. Jared. I didn't, I didn't raise my hand. Oh, I thought you were. But, yeah, but. <laughs> It must have been like a sixth sense. There was a, a great document, well, not documentary, but a movie called uh, Confederate States of America um, that came out about 10 years ago that explored that theory. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Any, uh, any other questions on Texas versus white? White. People sometimes say they, pay the, they pronounce the H in white like Cool Whip. <laughs> there was a family guy thing of that, right? Yeah. Cool Whip. Cool Whip. Cool Whip. Yes. Anyone else? Yeah. All right. Yes. All right, let's talk about the treaty power. The treaty power. So we don't talk much about international law in this class, um, but, but it does come up once in a while. So we have here... Oops. Why is this so slow? So we have here the supremacy clause, which also contains the treaty clause. Come on. I don't know why this thing's jumping so much. I was doing this last couple weeks. I'm hoping it fixes over the summer. So Congress has the power. I'm sorry, the president. He only needs the advice and consent of the Senate. Right? We did this before. There's no requirement that the House representatives vote on treaties. So he only needs the advice and consent of the Senate. Okay. Now, treaties by themselves are supreme law of the land. Okay, it says right here, this Constitution, oh, come on. Uh, well, I'll just put it this way. Right, so it says this Constitution, I don't know, I don't know why I'm apologizing. So it says, uh, this Constitution and laws of the United States, which we made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or shall be made, shall be the supreme law of the land. So what's the supreme law of the land? The constitutions, the laws, and treaties. Now that might, now that might give you a thought for a second. Wait a minute. If a treaty is a law of the land, and a treaty only needs to be passed by the Senate, isn't that a backdoor to making laws? Right? If Congress can make law, so if the president can effectively pass laws through the treaty power, doesn't that short circuit the House of Representatives? Okay, so that's uh, that, that that's a threshold question, and the short answer is, yeah, it does. Treaties are the supreme law of the land, right? Now, it's very hard for an individual 
to violate a treaty. It's very difficult, right? But Congress can make laws in pursuance to a treaty, right? It says, the Constitution of the laws of the United States, which will be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, which shall be made. Okay? So say, for example, the United States enters into a treaty to ban the production of chemical weapons, right? Oh, something crazy, like Bashar Assad in Syria, right? We are in an international chemical weapons treaty that says the United States will not permit chemical weapons. Okay? In pursuance of that, Congress passes a law saying, if you have a chemical weapon, we will prosecute you in a federal court. It is a federal crime to possess chemical weapons. Right? Everyone get that? All right. So Congress passed this law, which says you can't have these weapons. Now, what is the constitutional basis of this law? Is it a right? Well, yeah. Does a federal government have a health and safety clause? No. It's not related to commerce. You could relate it to commerce, okay? But I'm going to change the statute, right? The statute makes no reference to interstate commerce. The statute is only based on the treaty. The statute says, because of this treaty, we can regulate chemical weapons. It doesn't matter if these chemical weapons ever cross state lines or interstate commerce. The mere fact that you possess this chemical and that chemical conflicts with what's in this treaty, we will throw you to federal court and we will throw you to jail. Okay? That makes sense to everyone, right? Now, I'm not making this up. This is an actual case pending right now, which I was hoping would be decided by today, but the Supreme Court didn't, didn't cut me some slack there. So this is a case of United States versus Bond, and this is an awesome case, right? The facts of this case are, are like a soap opera on crack. So <laughs> you have this woman in, in, in Pennsylvania, Miss Carol Ann Bond, right? She learns that her neighbor is stooping her husband, okay, and having an affair. Google it. <laughs> That's a retreat, right? She learns that her neighbor is having an affair with her husband, or maybe boyfriend, I can't remember. So instead of, you know, confronting her, she orders some chemicals of Amazon, and she spreads them on her door handle and on her mailbox to burn her. She tries to burn her. So she puts all these, like, you can buy these chemicals on Amazon. They're not expensive. And she, she spreads them on her door handle and on her mailbox, right? And then we get some burns, whatever. She, you know. She's fine. So, so the neighbors like calls the cops and we're like, we don't care. This is stupid, right? This is just a simple battery, whatever. But what was her mistake? Mailbox. And what happened because of the mailbox? She called the federal postal investigator. They have snipers also, okay? I'm not joking. The federal, the, the post office, the post office actually has Humvees and snipers. I, I don't know why, right? Anyway, so she called the postal inspector, and they called the U.S. attorney, and they actually prosecuted her, I swear to God, under the Chemical Weapons Treaty for putting chemicals on a mailbox. We haven't even gotten to Bashar Assad for gassing his own people, right? But we were prosecuting this woman in Pennsylvania for, for putting these stupid chemicals, which we can find Amazon on the doorknob, right? Because they have nothing better to do with their lives, right? This is a good use of federal resources. Okay, so this went to the Supreme Court in uh, 2010 for the first go around, okay? And the Supreme Court said, okay, uh, I set it up. So what Bond said was first, this violates federalism, right? This, the federal government has no interest in policing a totally purely local matter, right? This, this is a purely domestic battery. There was no interstate connections proven. This is a purely local matter. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, you're right. The Tenth Amendment protects not only the states, but also the people. And people can raise claims on behalf of the Tenth Amendment, right? So that was the first case in 2010. Round two, okay, argued a few months ago. Brilliant, wonderful argument by Paul Clement always, right? And what they argue? They argue that this treaty does not give Congress the power to violate constitutional rights. Yes, that under the principles of federalism, Congress can't regulate this kind of purely interstate activity. And the treaty does not give them additional powers to do so. Paul Clement argued, 
just because you signed this treaty doesn't give you the power to violate states' rights in this matter. Okay? So this was argued like three months ago. It should be a decision probably next week at this point. And uh, why do we have this problem? Because of Oliver Wendell Holmes. Okay? Holmes. We come to the case of Missouri v. Holland. Right? This is the case, which I hope I have to never teach again because I hope it gets overruled in a few weeks. But what happened in Missouri versus Holland? Okay. Justice Holmes, glibly, in almost a, a dictum, said that treaties can expand the power of the federal government. Right? So what were the facts in that case? The facts were that the United States signed a treaty to protect birds. Birds, whatever, right? And as a result of this, they passed a rule which said that states can't take these birds. You can't go bird hunting. You can't harm the birds. You have to protect their habitats. This was the beginning of the tortoise thing, right? You have to protect the habitats, whatever. So Missouri objected to this, and they said this is unconstitutional. Missouri said this law violates with our Tenth Amendment rights. That the federal government can't invade our sovereign territory and tell us what to do with our birds. These birds are in our state. Mr. Bundy would approve of that argument, I think. In fact, Mr. Bundy is from a, a, a bit of an era gone by when those kind of arguments had some salience, right? So the actual fact of the case isn't very important, right? The, Holmes said that, yeah, this rule is okay. But why? He said a couple of things. First, he says the Tenth Amendment has these, what he called, invisible radiations. Invisible radiations, which sounds an awful like the penumbras. Oh, by the way, did anyone see the penumbras from the moon? The lunar eclipse the other night? Please tell me someone else looked at the moon and thought Griswold and the penumbras. Did anyone think of the moon, the lunar eclipse, and the penumbras? Thank you, at least one person. Right, remember the emanations from the penumbras, right? And remember the lunar eclipse. And is that the lunar eclipse the other night? Uh. So, I was on a plane at midnight. I got home at 1. It's fine. Fine, fine, okay. Liar. All right, so what, what did this case say, right? What did this case say? We usually start from the proposition that the Constitution only permits government to do what's in the Constitution, right? The government can only do what's in the Constitution. What Holmes said, though, was that signing a treaty expands that power. Signing a treaty gives the executive more power to do stuff. Why is this? Because the president has a duty to engage in foreign relations. And very often those duties of foreign relations are incompatible with federal law. So of course, when you have an obligation under international law and a constitution, according to Holmes, international law trumps. That if the if international law says we have to protect these birds, and the constitution says we can't, you know, harm these uh uh, uh, states that we can infringe on states' rights. You have a combination between states' rights and federalism and the treaty. The treaty trumps tr uh, federalism. Right? If the treaty says you can't harm these birds and the Constitution says you can't touch these birds, these are property of the states, the treaty wins. I wouldn't say that. What Holmes said is that federalism says these birds belong to Missouri. That's what federalism says. The Constitution says these birds can be protected. So the, I'm sorry, the treaty says that, and the treaty wins. Everyone get that? So what effectively Holmes says is that the mere fact that the United States enters into a treaty expands Congress's powers. Whereas they usually could not regulate birds in a state, now Congress can do this. Everyone okay with that? So let's go back to Carol Bond, our, our, our favorite psychopathic soap opera star from, from Pennsylvania, right, with the chemicals. Under normal circumstances, could Congress regulate a battery that has no connection to the industry of commerce? The answer is no. 
This, this is Lopez. This is the gun-free, the gun-free school zone case. The mere fact that a crime occurs without any nexus to interstate commerce, Congress can't touch it. But does signing a treaty expand that power? The signing a treaty, this International Chemical Weapons Treaty, which was meant to prosecute Saddam Hussein, right? Does that give the United States jurisdiction to, 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 to prosecute this woman under federal law? Coming soon. My prediction, the answer is no, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know if they overrule Missouri v. Holland. I hope they do. It's a terrible case. I hope I never teach it ever again. But that, that's the case. All right. So questions on Missouri v. Holland and, and Bond, which are which are closely related. Yes? Well, it seems like, it seems, I mean, the whole thing's really, the whole thing's really silly just because, like, it makes sense for that sort of rule to apply to international affairs, but when you're dealing with domestic affairs, when you're dealing with your own citizens, then why would we need that expansion rule at all? Well, that's what tees up the next case, Reed v. Covert, right? Right, so Reed v. Covert is the last case. And this case is in strong tension with Missouri v. Holland, right? So what were the facts in Reed v. Covert? Okay, what happened was you had some women on military bases overseas who killed their husbands, right? They, 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 the army wives, right? They killed their husbands. Were they prosecuted in a federal court? No. Were they given the right to trial by jury? No. Were they given the right to a grand jury presentment? No. They were tried in a military court overseas under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which is usually the uh, uh, system of laws reserved for service members, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you might recall the case of Ex Parte Milligan, right? What was Ex Parte Milligan? That was a Civil War case that said, as long as the federal courts are open for business, you can't try civilians in a military tribunal, right? <clears throat> were the federal courts open for business in 1957? Well, of course they were, okay? So why did the United States think that they could try Ms. Uh, I don't know, reader, I'm sure, they could try the wife in this military tribunal? They relied on a treaty. They relied on a treaty. They argued that the United States, the United Kingdom, had signed a treaty, which says that any crimes committed in England can be tried on the base. Therefore, that gives them the right to throw this woman before a military tribunal. <coughs> Because you can imagine if, a, if, a, uh, if there's a base in England and the wife kills the husband, in theory, the Brits could throw it to a British court. Or there's another case involving a Japanese murder. They could throw it to a Japanese court. Right? So the United States signed a treaty with these countries saying any crimes committed on the base, we'll try them, not you. And that makes sense, right? You, you don't want your citizens being thrown into a, uh, you know, in, into a foreign court. But the problem is... If they're being tried on the base, there's no jury, or there's a military jury, but not a real jury. There's not a grand jury presentment. There's not an independent judge in Article 3. You're having a military judge. So the question is, can this treaty cancel the Bill of Rights? Can this treaty deny to a citizen the right to trial by jury? Can this treaty give Congress the ability to take you out of a federal court? Right? Does this treaty expand the power of the federal government to prosecute people? Right? Now, if you had just read Missouri v. Holland, and you take Justice Holmes seriously, it's something I don't recommend you do, the answer is of course yes. Right? If you follow Missouri v. Holland, where he said that federalism can't get in the way, right? federalism can't stop this, treaty trumps, right? then of course they can try her in a military tribunal because the treaty empowers the federal government's power. Is that what the court held? No. Right? It didn't. So, so why not? They said that the Bill of Rights, and by that they actually mean the first eight amendments, they're, they're, they're not precise enough, but we precise here. The, the first eight amendments always constrain the federal government against citizens. So if you are a citizen, no matter where you are, you are bound by the Bill of Rights. If you are a U.S. citizen, the government must always protect your constitutional rights. We saw this in the Hamdi case, remember? Where there was a guy named Salim Hamdi. He was a U.S. citizen. He was locked up at Gitmo, right? He was in Guantanamo. Interestingly enough, we had Scalia and Stevens in dissent. 
saying that you can't lock this guy up. He's a citizen. Let him go. If you are a U.S. citizen, the Reed v. Cover Court says, the government must always protect your constitutional rights. But what about this treaty? Doesn't the treaty give you these uh, uh, necessary and proper powers, right? As a necessary means of enforcing this treaty, we need to put this woman before a military tribunal? Isn't, isn't this just the power of the government to enforce the treaty? The court says no. Why? What's at the top of this pyramid? It says the Constitution, the laws, and treaties. What's at the top? Constitution. The court says in Reed v. Covert, the Constitution trumps. Right? You can't waive. You can't ignore the Bill of Rights, which they mean the First Ten Amendments. They're not talking about the Tenth Amendment. They get to that in a minute. You can't ignore the First Ten Amendments. She needs a trial by jury. Right? All right. Margaret. Yes. Holmes was, yes. Yes. So the question here is a perfect one, right? Can you reconcile the view of the Tenth Amendment in relation to the Commerce Clause, right? So in the 1920s, when Holmes wrote that opinion, the Commerce Clause still meant something, right? Birds were not commerce yet. Birds were in commerce. The mere fact that a bird flew across a state line did not make it commerce. It was a bird. So it was at the time for the state to regulate wildlife. In fact, even today, every state has a wildlife department. They regulate wildlife in their states. But what Holmes said was, federalism is stupid, right? He's like, federalism doesn't make any sense. We don't need states' rights. And that was the prevailing wisdom. Recall that this court said the Tenth Amendment is but a truism. A truism. It doesn't mean anything. Okay? And then we get to Reed v. Covert. They say, there's nothing in Missouri versus Holland to the contrary. They said there was nothing in the treaty inconsistent with any provision of the Constitution. They don't consider the Tenth Amendment part of the Constitution. And that's, that's exactly what they're saying. The court was concerned with the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment is no barrier. So effectively what the court said in Reed v. Covert to answer the question is, the Tenth Amendment is no barrier. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't confer any substantive rights onto the states. Okay, so I mean, if you ignore the Tenth Amendment, then sure, yeah, one, one, three, eight are, are plenty good. The state can't violate your free speech, your right to bear arms, search and seizure, jury trial. But they can violate state rights, that's fine. Okay. Questions? Now, now, why is this bond case such a big deal? Are we really concerned about uh, prosecutions for Ordering chemicals on Amazon, putting them in your neighbor's mailbox. And the, the answer is no. Um, but, but part of the concern has to do with what would be the effect of, of signing various treaties that do things. For example, I don't know, say, say the United States enters into a climate change treaty, right? That could impose restrictions on energy production, whereas Congress might not want it. Or say, for example, uh, we enter into an international gun treaty, right? In theory, that could actually limit Second Amendment rights, although Reed v. Covert would be to the contrary. So the reason why this bond case is so significant is I think it will reconcile whether actually federalism and the Bill of Rights are on the same level, right? The treaty power should not allow the violation of either amendments, 10th or 1 through 8. And that's what the bond case will, will represent. All right, questions? All right, so I'll do a couple minutes in the exam if it starts typing, all right? So I hope you've all had a minute to take a look at the sample exam. Uh, we will do a review session on the last day of class. I'll be in this room. I got the room booked till 3, so I think that'll be plenty of time, but if we need to, we'll, we'll go later. Um, I want to talk for a brief moment about some of the um, uh, judicial time periods where we're looking at, right? And, and, and this should have been fairly... Uh, 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 discuss at various points in the semester, but there are about probably 10 time periods that I'm, I'm looking for. And th these aren't fixed in place, but they're, they're, they're kind of like, like, I use the word epoch, which means a time period. 
So, I mean, one of them would have to be at the beginning of the Republic, like in the Marbury era, right, where the Supreme Court's fairly new. And what would I be looking for here? You don't have any case law, right? You're going just by the text of the Constitution, right? You're based on just history. So that, that might be one period. Okay. Uh, two, um, broadly speaking, before the Civil War, we're talking about Dred Scott, right? We don't have the 14th Amendment yet. We have the states and the slavery and all those issues. That might be another uh, fertile ground to, to take a principle from. Uh, three, uh, during the Civil War, we had quite a number of cases where we discussed, you know, ex parte Milligan, can you shut down the courts in the Civil War, right? We talked about Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus. We talked a lot about that, and broadly executive power during a time of war. Um, for um, uh, after the Civil War, right, Reconstruction, right, we talked about this today. What were the powers of the states to, I'm sorry, what were the power of the federal government to uh, uh, limit the states after the 14th Amendment? Um, fifth, which is somewhat of a contemporary time period, is the Plessy era, the separate but equal, right? I, I, I could ask you about, you know, how would various segregation laws have been considered under Plessy, under the civil rights cases, right, under Slaughterhouse, under these various doctrines. Um, uh, six, uh, the period which is largely called the Lochner era, though I'm not a fan of that term, which would probably be from around the turn of the 20th century until the 1930s. This is a period where the court uh, was willing to protect certain economic liberties and have a, re a robust uh, due process clause uh, interpretation. Okay, um, seven, uh, New Deal, right? Before, during, after 1936. And I could test this in a whole host of different ways, and I think I showed it to you on the sample exam. I want you to be able to see how the law changed fundamentally with the New Deal. It's going to be somewhere around 1936, maybe before or after. I can tweak a little bit, but it's right around that time period. Uh, that was seven. Uh, number eight uh, would be the civil rights era, right? 1960s. We talked about the uh, Katzenbach case. We talked about the uh, Parts of Atlanta case, right? How did Congress use their commerce power to promote civil rights? Okay, uh, that's eight. Uh, number nine, um, broadly speaking, the, the 1980s and 1990s with federalism. In the 1980s and 1990s, there was a rededication to federalism and finding that there were... Uh, Limits on federal power, that there were states' rights, that the, uh, the Lopez case, the Gun Free School Zone case, the Morrison case, which was the Violence Against Women's Act, uh, New York versus United States, that was a take care case, um, Gonzalez versus Raich, that was a medicinal marijuana case, um, Obamacare, I can almost promise you Obamacare on the exam in some format. I don't know where, but it'll be there somewhere. It might not be obvious, but it'll, something Obamacare should be on the exam, I promise. I can't get it out of my head, it's, it's terrible. Um, and then, of course, 10 would be the present, right? Where are we, where are we now? And that, that's definitely Obamacare, right? Uh, 9 and 10 are probably fairly similar. Um, the only difference I'll ask, you know, the year is 2014, Supreme Court deciding a case next week, go, versus, you know, the year is 1995, and Lopez hasn't been argued yet. So uh, those are the 10 time periods that you should be thinking about. That might make things a little bit easier for you. Um, and all the cases have years in them, and... <laughs> People have asked me, how do I structure my notes? How do I structure my outlines? I mean, I think one cheat sheet you can make would be listing cases by years and maybe trying to fit them into those various time periods. So that way, if you see an exam, it's 19, you know, it, it, it's, it's reconstruction. It's like, oh, okay, here are my cases I can work with, okay? So that might be sorting cases by year might be one easy way of doing it, but it's not, not the only way. Um, uh, one other thing which I think might be helpful to think about is just because I tell you the years, you know, 1905, right? You know what happens next, right? You know what happens next. You know how the law evolves. So part of the memo is kind of, uh, part of the, part of the uh, exam question is kind of open-ended. It's like the judge asks you, how should you rule? You're free to take from the various doctrines that come later, right? And I don't care which way you go, left, right, doesn't matter to me. But you know how these things turn out. So you can actually work in stuff that happened later, but explain it as a matter of first principles. Like, this hasn't been decided yet. Here's how we can evolve the doctrine. And you'll see this in the Obamacare uh, question I gave you um, uh, on, on the sample exam. Like one of the questions was, you know, explain why Justice Owen Roberts shouldn't change his vote, right? You know what happens. He changes his vote. But you can bring in the knowledge of what happened as a result of that to help, help build out your answer. Okay? 
So I think if you, if you kind of focus your setting in these 10 time periods, which aren't, they're not set in stone, but, but, they're, but they're rough, it will, it, will, it will guide your studying a little bit and make, make things make a little more sense. Okay, is that a hand? Yes? Um, kind of throughout the way you <coughs> mentioned or we've gone into the themes of, you know, of certain justices during time periods, how can we... Right, so... All the opinions in your book have names next to them, right? And if, if I made a point of mentioning the justice, that's probably something to remember. Um, I'm not going to expect you to remember the vagaries, like what currency they were on, where they were born. Um, but if I'm talking about Justice McReynolds during the New Deal, you should probably know who that is. right? If I'm talking about Justice Brennan in the 1970s, you should probably know who that is. If I mention Justice Scalia during the 1990s, you should probably know who that is. If I mention John Marshall right, during Marbury, you should probably know who that is. If I mentioned Roger Tawney, right? Um, if you, let me put it this way. If you don't know who the judge is, it probably won't hurt you uh, too much. Um, uh, but if you know the judge, it might actually facilitate your answer a little bit better. Um, th these are things which I, 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 I mention because it makes the cases make a lot more sense. Um, so try to, try to find in your notes something. But if you, if you don't know anything about the judge, I'll probably give you a hint. For example, in the sample review question, I said that Justice McReynolds was a conservative and one of the four horsemen, right, who routinely struck down Roosevelt's programs. It will guide you in the right direction, but you're welcome to bring other things you know. Other questions? I know you have questions. You're lying. This is comma week, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I'm just assuming that everything has to be printed out that we... Uh, you can't bring electronic stuff. That's right. Okay. Totally open book, though. Whatever you want to bring, you can bring 100 pieces of paper. I don't care. So it won't help you. I mean, it will, but but not really. Let's see. So you're not going to ask us from like a particular judge's perspective. You're not going to like. No, no, no. I won't. It, it it'll be exactly like it was in the sample question. Like you have a conservative judge who votes against Roosevelt, and that might give you some hints. Yeah. Minus ten thousand words. I guess I'm trying to understand because I thought that last time you had said that you kind of didn't. You didn't really care whether uh, like what our argument was, as long as we made points. Right. Yeah. Um, so how what the justices are saying? Oh, I mean, how would we get credit for, for adding that and just flipping the like, change in the argument? Or? Well, I think I think I think for example, in the Obamacare question, you would probably mention the fact that Re Mick Reynolds has been very hostile <laughs> to us. So say, here's how I think the law should turn out, right? This this would be kind of like an icing on the cake, which I, I know law students don't like, mm -hmm. but it would enrich the answer. Right? It would show me that you've learned not only how to answer the question, but you've actually um, internalized a lot of the aspects of the justice that you spent a lot of time discussing. And I think when you see the sample exam answer, which I'll, I'll release probably next week, you'll see exactly how I, how I have in mind. Um, I, I, know, I know that's not very reassuring. Um, so I, the, way, the way I like to explain it, this will probably be between like the, the, you know, the, the B plus and the A minus. Right? What, what will make, the, will make the, the, the answer really pop is by showing that you've actually learn some of these justices and their personalities, especially it's going to be relevant to a case. And I promise it'll, it, it will be relevant, right? It will, it, will, it will be obvious what I'm, I'm looking for if you know the judge. Yeah. Okay, with that being said, um, adding the icing on the cake, we, we only have so much room. So how strict are you as far as format for following IRAC or not following IRAC? So uh, the, the, the issue with IRAC is that it focuses so much on restating what I've already written in the question. Which, so I don't recommend you do IRAC at all. Um, I, I want A. I want analysis. I know what the question is. I, I, I posed it. I wrote it. Right? I know what the facts are. I gave you the, I gave you the facts, right? I, I don't need you to restate the facts. Um, and, and especially here, my property example is a 500 word limit. Here it's 1,000, so I don't think words going to be a problem. I think you're going to have ample space to get your analysis in. Um, and you, you can fill as much stuff as you want. Um, it, there's, no, there's no magic rule. I don't have an answer. Um, it's interesting. The grading process is fascinating because when you I think there were 90 people in this class, when you read 90 papers, you start seeing various trends and patterns, and people usually fall along very similar lines. And the depth of the analysis comes out very quickly. I mean, that's the reason why I have the word limit. And it's people don't always understand, but it puts everyone on the exact same plane, right? Everyone has the exact same palette to work with, have the same space, and the amount of depth you can put into that in that one space is very easy to compare A to B. Right? So if one person, say, writes 800 words and another person like me writes 3,000 words, it's very difficult to compare the two. When I was in law school, I could blaze. I could type 3,000 words in a three-hour exam. 
praying that I wrote something correct, right? Here, you're on the same plane as your classmates. I can see, wow, so they have, you know, say five sentences for this one, and these five sentences, how deep are they? And this allows me to compare it much more. Yeah. Yes, one we present, one be one of those periods I mentioned. I like the idea that you're going to actually present one of I'm not telling you that. I'm not telling you that. I actually haven't written yet, so I don't even know. I'm going to write it. I'm going to try to write it after review session so I don't give away anything by accident. Because I, <laughs> well, sure, once I almost, no, I, I mean, I, I don't want to subcon, no, I don't want to subconsciously give it away, so I'm probably going to write it after the review session. That will be my, probably, plan. Well, the, 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 the review question is 1936. All right, I haven't read it yet, I don't know. Next question. <laughs> don't count on that, because it might not be, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Well, I mean, you can restate the rule um, in the sense that, and I'll, let, let's use the Obamacare uh, example. And, and again, we'll, we'll do this in, in, in great depth next uh, review session, whatever that is. You could say something like, um, uh, under, under controlling precedent, um, commerce refers to the exchange of goods across state lines, and health insurance is not the exchange of goods across state lines, right? So you've effectively given me the rule and the answer in the same sentence. Versus, under controlling precedence, com Congress has the power to regulate commerce. Commerce is defined as transaction between the two states. Health insurance is not a transaction between the two states. Therefore, Congress can't get regulated. So, I mean, I'm looking actually for concise answers, and, and these show me that you're not just copying from a word book, right? That's why I tell you your notes aren't going to help you, because if you copy rule statements from your, from your notebook, I know what you do, right? If you just copy some rule statement that looks familiar for your notebook, that, that, that tells me you spot the issue, which is worth maybe, you know, a little bit. But I want to see you actually apply it and give me an answer. Right? The purpose of this exam is to say you can't just copy something from a rule book. That, that, won't, that won't get you an answer. It'll get you something, but it won't get you there. It won't get you there. Questions? Do yourself a favor this weekend. Take, take an hour and look at the question, because it will make your studying a lot more focused. I understand this is comma week. I mean, that, that you, should, you should try to do that question before you even do your outlining. It, 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 it will be that important because it will focus you in the exact frame of mind of what to think about and how to organize your notes. Other questions? I, yes? Can we expect like, the two questions to look almost similar to the ones? Yeah, same format. Yeah, having like five questions in one. Exactly. Yeah, the, the reason why I have five questions that makes grading easy, right? So each question is worth 50 points. You know, 15, 50 is 100. There are five subparts. Each subpart is worth 10 points. Each subpart is graded on a scale of 1 to 10. It makes some grading really easy. So each each of those five subparts is worth a te possible 10 points. I add it all up, that's your score. Will each of subparts each have a word limit? You can divide that however you want, but I'd recommend you do it roughly equal because you have a total word limit of 1,000. That you can, I mean, you, if you if you if you know more about one topic than the other, you you can do that. But I try and keep it equal. Dana. Yes. A thousand words per question. Yes, or two questions. That's, that's what I said. Murmuring. What's up? Questions. Hands. Yeah. So in terms of we have these overall time periods. In terms of how we're going to divide up our outline to fit within these time periods, there's no good way. Yeah, I didn't think so. There's not. There's, I mean, and that, that's why we've had a 28. This way, 28 classes times. We, we've had 56 hours of instruction, right? We, we've had a lot of instruction. There's no good one way of dividing it up, because you have issues and you have time, and there's no, there's no good way. We need to understand both. That's why I recommend one possible benefit would be to sort all your cases by year. And that, 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 that's not that. All the cases we've done, just find the year in the book. And that might give you, you know, a way to jog yourself. Yes? Do you recommend organizing the by year and doing specific studies? That works. Or would you say it's more beneficial to organize it by year? Both. I mean, for purpose of studying, whatever works better for you, but both of those are important. I mean, there, there's no... It's interesting. So, like when I was picking Conlog uh, uh, case books, right? There's two different approaches. Like one divides things by topic, and one divides it by year. And I strongly considered the yearbook, but it would have been too confusing because we jump around so much. So I went with this book because it does things by 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 
topic was by year. So within the Commerce Clause topic, everything's listed by year. And that might be a good model for your outline as well. Clay? Only if it's relevant. I wouldn't waste too much time on that. I mean, if it's relevant, maybe. Like with with the question on Obamacare, you mentioned, like, yeah, the president proposed this court packing scheme. I mean, that that that'd be a salient fact to mention. Um, but I I wouldn't waste your time with that. I I, I know what happened. Yeah. But if you wanted to use old English in the 800 opinions, that'd be awesome. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. If we're, if we're using cases, can we just mention the first name? First name's fine. Um, so when we're writing our essay, since you as our audience, because I know like a lot of other professors want you to really break it down and be like every opinion you write, you think why, and then you bring break it down further. So we yeah. could assume if we say the Commerce Clause, you know exactly what we're talking about. I know about. what the Commerce Clause is, yes. That works. That's all you have to I'll show you a sample answer for our review session. You'll get a good sense of what I'm looking for. I'll try and get that up next week uh, again. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Take care.